ocean knowledge. We octopus are working towards an ocean our planet. We deeply believe that no one can change this world alone. But together, we can make this a better place, a better planet. Assalamu alaikum. This is Maksuda from Octopi. Hope you all are safe and sound in this pandemic situation. And hope one day we will overcome this situation. We need a better place, a better planet. So we have to ever from this moment. That's why Octopian is trying to gather an ocean our population. Because if we want to do something for our planet, we have to know about this. The most wondering thing is that we have a blue planet, not red, not pink, not green. Only blue planet in this solar system, where we have water in liquid form and water belongs to 71% of this planet's surface. So if we want to explore the planet Earth, we have to explore the ocean because ocean is the defining feature of this blue planet. As we promised, once again, we octopians are here to take you to the planet Earth exploration. Exploring ocean, explore the planet Earth too. In the last time, we had more than 1,000 participants from 40 countries. And this time, we have registered participants from 45 countries. Today, we have our first lecture, and this is taken by our Honorable Mr. Mahmoud Hassan. The lecture title is Know the Ocean. This is also our slogan, as we want to have an ocean on our planet. Dr. Mahmoud Hassan, he done his PhD fellow in physical and operational oceanography. Department of Physics and Astronomy, University of Bologna, Eurasia. Here you will have an idea about basic oceanography topics, introduction about ocean dynamics, geophysical parameters, oceanic phenomena, nutrient cycles, climate connection, etc., etc. This lecture will dive into you to the knowledge. Well, no more talks. I am handing over this session to Mr. Mahmoud Hassan. If you have any question during the session about the lecture, you can ask us in the chat box. If you are seeing the recorded file, you can ask any question in the comment section. We will try to answer. I am now handing over this session to Mr. Mahmoud Hassan. Sir, please. Okay. Thank you, the host and co-host, uh, for inviting me for this lecture. So I'm pleased to present uh, some of my knowledge with you people. So here, uh, do you hear my, first of all, you need to confirm, do you see my, do you see my screen clearly? It's fine? Yes, of course. And uh, the noise is clear? Yes. Okay, nice. So here I have uh, my outlines, what I'm going to talk. Um, Initially, there was a plan to talk a lot, but uh, uh, now I have divided the sections that I'm going to talk for these lectures. So I will talk about the oceans, some seas, and what are the upper oceans, ocean bottom, and oceanic zones. At the same time, I'll talk about some ocean parameters, how ocean is connected to climate change, and how ocean is related with the carbon cycle and the acidic ocean. And last, I will talk some little bit about why we should study the ocean science. So here, uh, there are a lot of topics that actually we can talk. We know ocean is a vast, but I try to cover the some most important topics that uh, being a new wise or being a um, fresh people in this background, they should know because ocean science is a big, big uh, arena. There are many, many divisions. Uh, the people who study the ocean, they know about uh, 
physical oceanography, chemical oceanography. But uh, in this lecture, I will try to over make an overview of the oceans. Uh, so okay, let's move to the next slide. The, okay, the world ocean. Uh, so what is the ocean, world ocean? Then ocean is the largest body of water that on the planet Earth. So we can see from this map that where is the location of the ocean and where is the location of the land. So the ocean takes the two thirds of the earth surface of, with the saline water. And as usual, we know that 97% of the all planet are water is inside the ocean. There are many, many facts and scientific information we can talk about. So, but most importantly, we should know that that ocean is the largest water body on this planet Earth. We can talk about the salinity, we can talk about temperature, we can talk about a lot of other ocean dynamics, but this one lecture is not enough to talk about all this. So this is the, just an overview of the ocean that uh, can explain in a short form. So, okay. Now we can see about the upper ocean. How many oceans on the earth? So what is their idea? So in principle, we know that there are five oceans, but also some people talk about seven oceans. How can it be seven oceans? We have Pacific, we have Atlantic, Arctic, Indian and Southern Ocean. But Pacific Ocean is divided into two parts, like South and North at the same time, Atlantic North and Atlantic South. So that's why people call it seven oceans. But in principle, we have only five oceans. So Pacific Ocean is the most, uh, the maximum depth we can see. The average depth of the Pacific Ocean is 4,028 meter. As usual, as this is the deepest uh, part uh, can, uh, you know, the humankind already found in the, in the Mariana Trench, you know about this uh, 11,003 uh, meter. That is the deepest point of this uh, world ocean. On the other hand, uh, you can see Atlantic Ocean and Indian Oceans comparatively have the similar depth uh, range, like 3,926 to 3,963 meter. And Arctic Ocean is, Arctic, hello? Arctic Ocean is the, is the shallower ocean and and the, uh, the, deep, uh, the depth range of uh, Antarctic Ocean is 4,000 to 5,000 meter. So now we, we talk about the seas. What do we know about the seas? So seas are the small branches of ocean that partially enclosed by the land. We call them as sea. So of course sea must be connected with the ocean and seas are must be shallower than oceans and sea there should be as, can be salt. Of course there is salt water, but can be fresh water like in many countries, many, many, uh, many European nations, there are big lakes, they call it by sea, but in technically they are not sea, but they call them as sea. But if we define the sea connecting with the ocean, there should be a salt water, there must be salt water. And remember there are big seas, Mediterranean, Arctic and Black Seas are part of the Atlantic Ocean, even they are located inside very enclosed region that's surrounded by the land. So you can see in the map, uh, uh, like in the Mediterranean Sea, you can see the, that Mediterranean Sea is surrounded by the European uh, countries, but it has a connection with the, with the ocean that is on uh, North Atlantic Ocean. However, uh, there is not technical definition of sea amongst oceanographers. So the one condition must be remembered and it is true that it is a part of uh, subdivision of ocean and there should be an oceanic crust on its floors. So here in, in the exam, uh, in the picture image, you can see the Adriatic Sea, Ionian Sea, and even it is a bigger sea, but it's still there are some small sea inside this uh, region. So how deep is the ocean? 
So just a comparison between uh, the mount mountains on the land and the deepest part of the ocean. So we know about the Mount Everest is 8,848 meter. You can see that you can see the the uh, the highest point of the on Earth is Mount Everest, and it is the sea uh, in the elevation of the continents and it is a sea level. So you can say big difference in in from the pictures how the deepest part of the ocean is 11,000 meter as we already mentioned in the first uh, slide. So you can see that the deepest point is still higher than the, the maximum point of the on Earth. And uh, the average depth of the ocean is 2,800 meter. So this is to just to give an idea how much uh, the difference in the depth in the ocean and the in the, uh, the mountains in the land. And we only know about 10% of this ocean. So let's move to ocean water. So there are many, some features on the ocean floors. So we call them as like continental shelf. We can see from this, uh, uh, this picture that this is a continental shelf region. Continental shelf region is, is the starting point of this continent where the land uh, touches the ocean or seas. So, and then the continental slope. At the end of the continental shelf, we can see the shelf region that suddenly drops up. That means when the continental shelf start to move to, to the lower, then the continental slope starts. Then the abyss, the deeper region of this ocean, you can see from this uh, uh, figure, and the Ibiza plan. Most of the ocean actually covered by the Ibiza plan. This figure is not the perfect demonstration of the web, but this is a, just a theoretical uh, demonstration uh, pictures that how a ocean floor could be. So we can uh, see there are the geot, sea mounts, and mid ocean ridge. The sea, we have sea mounts on the land, or we have sea mounts on the in the ocean. The, uh, we have geot that is the sea mount, but with the flat area. But one of the most important oceanic phenomena is the mid-oceanic ridge that we can see. This is uh, very interesting uh, to know that how this mid-oceanic ridge is created. We know about uh, plate tectonic theory. Uh, maybe the people who study the ocean or meteorology or other earth science, they should know it. But uh, I can explain a little bit about this, uh, how this. Uh, so we know that we have uh, two kinds of plates that is a contender place and oceanic place. So contender place on the land that when they collide, we, we feel the earthquakes and in the ocean, under the ocean, when the oceanic place collide, then this kind of uh, formation yeah, we can uh, see. It's like mid oceanic ridge. So this is a, like a divergent uh, uh, boundary place when two oceanic place collide and but when they cannot uh, uh, pass each other, but they move apart from there, then this this big crack is uh, created in the under the ocean. And and for the trench, uh, it is this uh, opposite thing of the of the uh, plate boundary for the for the, it is not spreading; it is a subduction of two oceanic plates. Mm -hmm. When two oceanic plates collide, but one plate move on the other place, that means a subduction uh, situation that creates a trench like this. So it is corrosionic, we know about the minor trench. So in this figure, you can see better in the, the continental margin area. This is the continental margin area and the deep ocean basin. And this is the mid ocean ridge. Even you can see from this figure is the, the cracks here, but it is, of course, it is under the ocean, but to just to show how it could be. So this is the big, 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 big uh, uh, cracks under the ocean that is called mid oceanic grade. And this is interesting. On, on the earth, you can see at two points, you can see these uh, boundaries on the earth. 
one is in the Iceland and another point is, I can remember it is in the uh, Africa, somewhere in Africa. So there are two points you can see this, uh, these cracks on the land. So that means uh, they, uh, they come to the surface of the land and you can see some only two points on the earth. So the largest ocean is the largest body of water. So, but it is divided into some smaller parts that we call it sea, bay, gulf, or strait, or coast, whatever. So, obviously, smaller part of the ocean is called the sea, but uh, there should be a, a land part in the sea. And normally, bay is a water body that is surrounded by land on this side. You can see from this. Uh, these pictures that uh, is a uh, here you can see in these pictures we can see the ocean, also the Red Sea or the Gulf. There is a connection with the Red Sea because it is a uh, it is not uh, completely surrounded. But if you see the Persian Gulf, you can see that there is a three side. There's a it is surrounded by the land. That's why it is called uh, uh, Gulf. But I will show you a video in later that you can understand better. On the other hand. Uh, if you uh, look at the Baltic Sea, as I talked about uh, uh, before, that Baltic Sea is part of the Atlantic, but you see it is surrounded by the uh, land in the uh, three sides. But at the same time, you can see some Gulf in this sea. So like you see, it is surrounded by the land. So that is uh, make it clear distinction between the sea and land. What is the, what is the difference between sea uh, and bay and the gulf and and coastline we know about the coast uh, the coast is near the um, near the sea ocean uh, where where the where the continuous interaction between in the land and sea which we call it is an intertidal zone or or some other definition we can explain later but um, I can show you other picture for the strait. This is a strait that it's a narrow passage between two land. That means it is a narrow passage, but it is not surrounded by two or three sides. So there you get the, the ships or other um, boats and can pass easily. And so I want to show you some one video so that you can understand the better what is the difference between this uh, Bay, Gulf, and Straits. Seventy percent water. An Australian should know that better than most. But there are some interesting things about bodies of water. Named. Why is this called an ocean and this a sea? What makes this a gulf and this a bay? We'll start big. Oceans are large bodies of salt water which surround continents. Australia is in between the Pacific, Indian and Southern Ocean. Oceans are generally divided between continents, but technically it's one big body of water, sometimes referred to as the World Ocean. Seas are large bodies of salt water connected to the ocean, but they're also partly surrounded by land, like the Tasman or Coral Sea. At the top end of Australia, you'll find a gulf, a large body of water enclosed by land on three sides with a relatively narrow opening. Down the other end, you'll find the Great Australian Bight. A bight is an inward bend in a coastline or a river, less of a deep indentation than a gulf. And right next to this bight is a strait, a narrow passage of water connecting two large bodies of water. Bass Strait separates Tassie and Victoria. Torres Strait Island is a from, you guessed it, the Torres Strait. Let's swing by Sydney. Here you'll find heaps of bays. They're like the smaller siblings of gulfs, but with a wide mouth. And small bays are called coves. They're often sheltered between rocky headlands. Of course. Okay, I will stop here. So these are the part that I wanted to show you to get an idea. So there are some other features that uh, we can talk about in, in short, like Delta. Um, there is a landform created from the deposit of the river that actually 
uh, this kind of uh, delta created the large amount of uh, siltations that comes from uh, from the rivers. The, the best example we can say talk about the Ganges River that uh, creates the the insurance area in in the coastline of Bangladesh. So uh, you can see the idea how can it can be. So this is to show then how the delta is created. Like this is the uh, mouth of the river and the river flows uh, brings uh, uh, million million cubic uh, uh, meter per uh, the 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 marsh through the mountains and and through the other rivers. And there are other uh, interesting features uh, that is called fjord, but that is also part of the ocean, uh, part of the ocean, uh, because um, when the signal, uh, sea in, 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 uh, comes inside the narrow border that is surrounded by the cliffs or mountains, so then it is called uh, like a fjord. Even it is a part of the ocean, but uh, it looks like a, a river, but not. It is, there is a direct connection with the sea. And it forms when the glacier cuts like you shaped for million and million years during the process of ice segregation. And it can come, it can flow in a long area inside the land. And this kind of uh, fears you can uh, find in Norway, New Zealand, Chile, Canada, and Alaska. Okay, and then all the oceans, seas, gulfs, or bay, whatever we we call them, they are one continuous large body of water. Why? Because there is a theory we call this, it's a continuous deep theory. It was proposed by German meteorologist and geophysicist, uh, Alfred Wagner. So if you know about him. So uh, according to his theory, 200 million years ago, all the planet was together. So it is called Pangaea. So then slowly, slowly that, uh, this uh, this big uh, land body started to spread that we can see the 100, 300, 100, 300, 30 million years ago, then 65 million years ago, then the present situation. So then the world ocean, you can see. So it was uh, like a hypothesis still when he died, he, he, the hypothesis was rejected, but uh, Still nowadays, uh, we at the beginning we, we talk about being ocean river. We, we talk about this uh, continental deep theory that uh, ocean is a itself is a big one uh, continuous large water body. So now the oceanic zones. Uh, here are some ideas we can divide the oceanic zones uh, on the base of light availability, distance from shore, depth of water. So. Uh, light availability, we can divide on the photic zone and aphotic zone. So aphotic zone and aphotic zone is the topmost part, the surface of the ocean, where the light is most uh, strong. <clears throat> and distance from shore, we can divide into intertidal zone, aerotic zone, and oceanic zone. I'll talk about all details in later. And we can divide the, the, the ocean on the depth of water, para, Pelagic zone, benthic zone, and EVSL zone. Okay, you can see uh, how it is divided. This photic zone is uh, fallen to 200 meter, and then the mesopelagic zone is until 1,000 meter, and the bethypelagic until 4,000 4, meter, and uh, the rest of the thing uh, covers the EVSL zone, so below 4,000 meter, and there's a hadal zone is called a 6,000 meter. <clears throat> and this is the same um, idea, but uh, to show to an um, example, what are the which are the animals live in that uh, particular depth? Uh, like if you talk about uh, photic zone that covers the 200 meter, you can see the animals with the phytoplankton, the geoplankton, and other uh, some uh, big animals, shark and turtles, and if you go below um, this depth, you can find the uh, whales, octopus, and other sponges. And if you go far, far below this uh, 4,000 meter, that is the most darkest uh, region of the ocean. And you can find where some strange animals, strange fishes, like angler fishes, 
and some other sponges and and cucumber something like of course this features is just showing to the general features of the sea bottom but uh, this can vary on the uh, depth range somewhere depth range maybe four to one thousand meter in the sea in some sea basin and and in the ocean you can find the more than four thousand or five thousand meter so but this is just an um, common scenario of the depth of the ocean and now we can divide the uh, ocean i mean the shoreline that is called intertidal zone the intertidal zone is the tidal range between the highest and lowest tide on the shoreline so that means uh, this zone starts from where the the tide reach at its maximum and and the next point when the tides finish it is uh, last line so this zone is we call it like a intertidal zone so like if the tide uh, can reach until this point and if the tide finishes at this point this region is called that intertidal zone and this uh, can be a sandy or rocky but this zone is very harsh for the organisms because uh, but uh, during this time, six hours, we know the tidal period is six hours, high tide and low tide. So the organisms uh, who uh, stay in this region, they need to adapt to the both uh, submerged and the water condition. You can find some common animals like uh, starfish, comes, oyster, and other, etc. And can give it a, uh, uh, as a narrative zone. This is actually <clears throat> from the lower tide zone, but it covers until 200 meter depth over the continental shelf. And this is, zone is very oxygenated, and you can find uh, many animals like turtles, dolphins, corals, starfish, and and this, remember this 200 meter is, covers the most productive zone, as well as the coral reefs. We can find all the coral reefs, coral areas under this depth. So that means that these zones are the most uh, productive ecosystem uh, in the world ocean and in the seas. And this is the home of the all photosynthetic life of the phytoplankton and zone. Now come to the oceanic zone. That is beyond their continental shelf. So that keeps uh, uh, more space for the mammals, especially <clears throat> the whales and uh, the sharks, dolphins, all the big animals. But this distribution of species decreases with increasing depth. This is uh, 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 we, we saw in the, in the distribution of the, of the depth where the which animals can stay. So when the depth increases, that means the species distribution also decreases. Only we can find the big whales, like the blue whales, they can go far the depth of the oceans. So also here I want to show you some uh, pyramid of this uh, uh, lives, the pyramid of this uh, uh, animals, how they survive in this. This is very basic one that the phytoplankton, you know, is a primary producer of the ocean. So they produce food for the zooplankton, who are the primary consumers that are consumed by the small fishes and then consumed by the large fishes. This is this is a cycle is continuous uh, in all every ocean everywhere in the in the in the earth or as the as usual in the in the ocean. So so this this is a just to show how the life system uh, survives grow and grows in the ocean. And the uh, photic zone, so in the photic zone, we can see all the primary production occurs and we can see the high, find the high concentration of plants, the algae, but the phytoplankton and cigars. And most of the fish live in this region. And as I told already, so the, most productive ecosystem are in this zone, like coral reefs. And aphotic zones, we can, we can understand easily. So there is no light, means there is no photosynthesis. And water pressure increases with the depth. So 
if you go down more down in the depth, so the pressure will be more higher. And also temperature decreases with the depth change. So oceanic zone on the depth. So the benthic zone is the, the, the lower region, is the bottom region of this uh, ocean. So it is low oxygenation and constantly low temperature. The animals here feed on the, because there is no photosynthesis, there means there is no primary production. So the animals feed on the detritus or other animals. So there is less life in this region. And Ibisal John that I already told, it covers the most uh, part of the ocean floor. And uh, you can find some strange animals like anglerfish and crawling spider. Of course, there is no light in that region and cold temperature like minus two degrees centigrade and the water pressure is very extreme. Okay, now we talk about some, some parameters, some important parameters as uh, being an oceanographer, uh, also uh, being a researcher, uh, also people should know that uh, what are the important parameters that uh, 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 the scientists or researchers are, are continuously observing for the oceans. So this uh, image shows a chlorophyll distribution uh, it, it is from the satellite uh, image. So you can see this green area <clears throat> is the chlorophyll distribution is high in over the whole ocean. This is very clear that uh, uh, the chlorophyll concentration is high near the coastal region. You can see all the coast, like here in the Indian Ocean, <clears throat> here, and it is in the Arctic Ocean, and in the North Atlantic and the Arctic Ocean. But you can see in the depth, the, uh, the, in the Pacific and Atlantic and the Indian, the, the, in the depth, in the ocean, in the deeper part, is the uh, concentration is low. And also, this is, a, uh, I think, uh, this picture is from summer spring or the summertime. If you compare uh, some pictures from the winter time, you can see the variation in the chlorophyll range uh, in, in some part here. Or uh, maybe you can see more lower in this part. But the, the, the main idea is the photosynthesis occur with this deeper 200 meter because this is a lower depth region in all the coastal area. Now the sea temperature, uh, this picture also shows the sea surface temperature over the world ocean. So the sea temperature can reach over 30 degrees centigrade, but you can see that in the tropic, the tropic area is the mostly, mostly <clears throat> hot region of the ocean because why the, the earth, when the earth moves, it stays always with the tropical side. So, and the poles are always receives the less sun, sunlight. That's why this tropic, tropical, subtropical region are always very hot and the temperature is more than 30 and 35. Uh, uh, degree centigrade. So, and at the poles, the temperature can be le less than uh, minus 20 degree centigrade, but it, it uh, there's an equilibrium sea strait because of their, their sea ice and, and, and the land sea uh, ice in the uh, Antarctica and their sea ice in the Arctic Ocean. So they balance the temperature. So you can see the blue uh, color that shows that uh, the temperature range is uh, minus two to five degrees centigrade. So this is the temperature distribution in the world ocean, this uh, general uh, idea, but of course it, uh, this distribution can vary uh, between uh, summer to winter. Then you can see some uh, differences in, in this part or on this part is maybe lower temperature. And the sea surface salinity. So we know ocean is saline, but the salinity range is it's not very variable. It, uh, the range uh, falls between 34 to 36 PSU, we call it practical salinity unit. But relatively we find 35 PSU, which is constant for the sea order. So gyres, gyres are the surface currents. So how the gyres forms? Due to the rotation of the earth, gyres forms in the oceans. You can see there are five big gyres in the world ocean. 
like the North Pacific gyres, South Pacific gyres, and the North Atlantic and South Atlantic and the induction gyres. Here, one important dynamics to remember, these gyres in the, in, the, in the Northern Hemisphere, it moves in the right side of when you stay in the Northern Hemisphere. It moves into the left when you're in the Southern Hemisphere. Why? Because this, we, this is called a Coriolis effect. Due to the more rotation of the earth, uh, any object deflects to the right in the Northern Hemisphere. So you can see from this, uh, uh, this uh, picture. And also the Southern Hemisphere, the object deflects to the left. So this is called a Coriolis effect. So due to this region, same thing, same principle works for the all kind of cyclones, storms. So if you see cyclones, that forms in the this part that will rotate on the right side. If cyclones, hurricanes, whatever storms forms in this part, that will uh, that will rotate in the left side of the directions. So now we talk about the thermal and circulation. It's also a large surface current in the ocean. Also, we call it an oceanic conveyor belt. So why thermohaline circulation? Because it is a density driven. <coughs> Sorry. Oh, sorry, because, you can uh, continue. Yeah, no, sorry, I had to drink. Uh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> so this thermal circulation depends on the density and, and uh, <clears throat> temperature. And <clears throat> you can see from this uh, map, um, the map of this uh, thermal circulation, this warm surface current, it flows from this part to this part of the ocean, from Pacific Ocean to Atlantic Ocean, to then the Arctic Ocean. Here in the Arctic Ocean, this warm water, warm surface water, <clears throat> gets the coldness from the from the poles. Then it gets uh, say, uh, yes, <clears throat> more. Uh, it gets getting more dense and cold. That means the water is getting dense and colder and start to sink in in the Arctic Ocean. So then it start to sink at the depth of the ocean. Then it starts to flow again, and this large <clears throat> current then uh, carries the cold water from the Arctic Ocean, and then it continues until this uh, uh, this pattern passing the South Southern Ocean, then it continues uh, until Pacific Ocean, then comes to the surface, then it gets as the warm from the, um, so from the interaction of the atmosphere and uh, ocean, then it, it is getting warm and saline in this, uh, more saline in this part. So it is a continuous process. The average age, the resident time of this circulation is 1,000 years. But some cases, it is 1,500 years. So the Pacific water is, uh, carries the uh, old water. If you compare the timeline, um, the age of this uh, circulation, it carries the nutrient-rich but oxygen-poor water in the Pacific. On the other hand, Atlantic carries the more younger water and but the, it carries the cold water poles to every ocean. That means it carries the cold water to every ocean. That means the water is a circulation process. And eventually it ensures the top to bottom exchange of all the water in the oceans. In this uh, picture, you can see the better idea. So the deep water formation, as I told, as I explained to you that uh, when the warm and saline water comes to this Antarctic water, then it sinks um, because of the cold and uh, denser, it getting denser and colder, then it sinks in the, get near the Greenland Sea, near the, near the Arctic Circle, then it starts to sink, then this flows and passing to the North Atlantic to then comes to surface of the, so in the Southern part. So here in these two 
one, two, and three part here, all the deep water formation of the world oceans. Uh, so there are other kind of um, uh, current called is upwelling, but it's a kind of vertical currents. So it is mostly driven by the wind. So you can see this map, when wind starts to blow along the coast, along the shoreline, so it, uh, uh, it uh, displays the surface uh, water, then the nutrient rich water from the deeper part of the ocean comes to the surface. And during this process, uh, uh, the bottom water brings uh, nutrient rich water to the surface. That is very important for the productivity production of co in the coastal area. And nutrient, how a nutrient produce is uh, due to bacterial uh, decomposition, uh, the nutrients are produced at the bottom of the oceans. And this appalling process bring this nutrient uh, into the surface. And uh, the same principle works for the Northern and Southern hemisphere. So there's a two, two, two mechanism for appalling and downwelling. So appalling is means sim a simple movement of the deep water to the surface, downwelling movement of the surface water to the down. So there are many kinds of upwelling. So coastal upwelling, equatorial upwelling, wind driven upwelling. So I will not go details in that kind of, but I will show just an example. So coastal upwelling, this is an image from the satellite. Uh, it shows the production, I mean chlorophyll range uh, due to our upwelling process. Uh, and you can see and that this uh, here, the range is very high because uh, 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 it is a coastal upwelling process uh, and here the production range is high. So it's, here the coastal upwelling uh, is working for that uh, region. Okay, now time and space scale of ocean variability. As I just talked about some few phenomena of the ocean, but there are many other phenomena we can talk about. As I told, oceanography is a very big, big uh, arena. So there are many, many other uh, dynamics and parameters, phenomena we can, uh, but we in short, I can talk about uh, some phenomena that uh, in the ocean that uh, based on the space and time scales. The scales uh, space based on the global, as you can see 10 meter to 10,000 kilometer. And the, uh, and the time scale at the same the global from a month uh, to one hour to like 100 years. So on the base of this, we can see the global scale. We can see the global warming, climate change, whatever did fall into this categories. Like because global warming is a big, so it, it takes the, all the space on the earth. At the same time, also the time duration is for like more than 1,000 years. So climate change is not happening for one, within one day or two days, one month. It takes 1,000 years to be affected on the, in, on the Earth. And if you then next stage is synoptic scale. So in the synoptic scale, you can find the Ross biops. As I told, there are some waves and other phenomena. Uh, El Nino, El Nino, these are two important uh, features in the oceans and the other, other seasonal cycles that fall into this categories, uh, but it takes like one year to three years time for these uh, uh, features to happen in the Pacific region. So, but and the, the coverage area of this um, phenomena is around 1000 kilometer. Then we have the measure scales uh, for, for hours to the days like intertidal, um, <clears throat> Tides, coastal upwelling, and eddies. Then we have a small scale, like uh, it we, we takes only a few hours, like turbulence, uh, some inertial waves, and micro eddies. This falls into, into these categories. This actually is a very short time phenomena in the ocean, like a uh, few hours, hours to few uh, one days or something, sometimes few seconds, like micro eddies. So, this uh, should give an idea what are the, if the time and space of variability in the oceans. These are the main features or whatever we call. So, and that fall into this uh, criteria of space and time scale.
Okay, so why you should study or why you care about the ocean? We have tidal forces. We need to know the tidal range because there are two high tide, low tide regions and that it follows by the ships and other uh, uh, boats and the fishermen. We need to know the web dynamics because during the cyclone storms, we need to know how much web uh, can flow over the coastline. We need to know the temperature chlorophyll, the, to know the primary production, know the fish, where we can find the fish species more. We need to know the ocean current, because ocean current big, big, big. Ocean current bring the weather pattern because there is a big connection with ocean currents and the weather change. And the ocean gives energy. We get the well, coal, minerals. We get the fish and fisheries. We recreation. We enjoy the seaside. We can do the beach. We do the surfing. And we have the maritime traffic. We transport all the goods through the, and it is a cheaper one, uh, cheaper than the land part. And then we have contact the plate tectonics when because uh, uh, this uh, creates earthquakes and then did bear and due to earthquakes in under the ocean and there could be a tsunami in the coastal area so we need to know this we have natural calamities like um, cyclones hurricanes to all the big hurricanes storms or cyclones whatever you call it that are created on the oceans we have sea level rise because we are we are concerned about sea level rise because we are, we think the lower part of the ocean, lower part of the coastal area can be gone submerged by next 50 years. So we need to talk about that. And the important thing, climate change, we are talking about climate change. And so we need to study the ocean. And we have nutrient cycles, carbon, nitrogen. These are the part of the global cycle that is a process inside the ocean and in the atmosphere. And we have the water cycle that is a hydrological cycle. So the, all this topic, I want to focus, why? Because these all things we need to ocean because all are relevant to oceans. So let's see, it is not possible to talk about all the topics seen in this uh, within one hour, but I will focus on the climate change, uh, uh, how ocean, uh, plays an important role in this climate change. So role of ocean in, in the climate change. So the global warming, we can see the temperature is rising, uh, is uh, the annual temperature rising for 1850 to 2012. And, um, and this uh, temperature rising is unequivocal and, and the rate is very high. Uh, the, you can see from these two difference. And it is projected that ocean temperature uh, can be um, rise by 21st century. And it is all from the, of course, it is all from the model outputs. Now, absorption of heat by ocean. So climate of Earth is warming, it is proven, but portion of absorbing that heat. So the excess amount of heat is absorbed by that, our ocean. So the, this climate is warming because why increase the amount of greenhouse gases, we know about this in the atmosphere. And ocean is warming because of containing excess amount of heat from this climate. This is, is very important dynamics. Uh, and by, so far the ocean is the largest reservoir on this earth that absorbs 93% of global warming. So you can see the <clears throat> trend line of atmospheric carbon dioxide that is increasing from since 1950. So you can, you can see the range is very high, but why is global warming going? As you can see this, this uh, big circle, the ocean, ocean, only ocean is absorbing this 93% of global warming. And only uh, uh, less percentage uh, is very neg negligible in the atmosphere and in the cryosphere and other part of the earth. So, Absorption of carbon dioxide by ocean. So we know about this uh, basic uh, equation, how photosynthesis process occurs. Uh, sunlight, with the use of sunlight uh, and water, the animals uh, make food. And then this picture, you can see the uh, carbon cycle. So this 
atmospheric carbon that is uh, released in the we know about uh, the, the atmospheric carbon dioxide should be 350 ppm but now it's more than 400 ppm because of this uh, uh, anthropogenic sources uh, so that extra carbon dioxide comes to the ocean due to the interaction of that ocean atmosphere interactions and mixed with the water and used by the um, animals and then it released by during the during the death of the animals then it comes to the surface of the uh, through the surface of the ocean to the atmosphere it, it is a process it is a cycle so so atmosphere uh, uh, conserve this carbon dioxide but at the same used by the plants like photosynthesis process animals and released by the plant animals so this all is a, is a cycle so no matter is created or destroyed in this process everything is every matter is in the cycle so there should be a balance with the state of this atmospheric carbon dioxide but there is no balance the carbon dioxide concentration have increased by 40 percent since the pre-industrial time and the ocean has absorbed about 30 percent of this emitted anthropogenic atmospheric carbon dioxide that is causing the ocean acidification the acidic ocean and fate of the marine organism this is the next important thing that we need to consider because the impacts of the climate change so we know sea water is likely alkaline the average pH of is 8.2. This is, should be as a normal range. But when ocean is absorbing additional 30 to 40 percent carbon dioxide, what is happening? It is forming carbonic acid and it is lowering the pH. From this equation, this is a very basic equation. Uh, the atmospheric carbon dioxide mixed with the water in the ocean that convert into the liquid form carbon dioxide. And with the water, it forms a the bicarbonate and that uh, carbonic acid then then uh, then it forms a bicarbonate and hydrogen ion. that bicarbonate ion is uh, used by the animals main animals in the ocean from this uh, you can see the more clear uh, uh, lines uh, how is this uh, process going on the carbon dioxide and the water forms of uh, carbonic acid and hydrogen ion bicarbonate ion so now how it really affects the marine animals. So the calcium carbonate, we know the absolute uh, used by the calcareous animal and is soluble with the pressure level. So calcium carbonate becomes more soluble with the lower pH. Marine organisms, many are like calcareous shells, they use this calcium carbonate. And if the carbonate shells and skeleton dissolved, uh, below this depth we call this compensational depth okay first we need to know the what is compensational depth so compensation depth is the depth where production and respiration is equals so from this point to above you can see the production is higher than the respiration but below this depth the production is lower so respiration rate is higher so at the same time there is a comp there is a depth is a called calcium carbonate compensation depth. So when the supply of calcium carbonate is getting lower in that region, that is called when the called the calcium carbonate compensation depth. And the animals who use this uh, carbonate for their forming of shells and their skeletons, and they are they start to dissolve and they start to die. So this is a simple uh, graph. You can see that these are shellless animals. Uh, they use this uh, when they start to, uh, when there is less calcium uh, in the water, that it means the ocean is getting acidic, they, they are getting dye. So this will be the fate of the marine organisms if the ocean is getting more acidic. So study of ocean or oh, an interdisciplinary science. This is just to uh, give an idea people who are not coming from the ocean science, marine science or related science. Uh, oceanography is a big arena, uh, but it covers other disciplines also. So it covers the physics that if you study the waves, 
currents, you need to start know the physics, you need to know the meteorology, so the weather forecast, the storms, cyclones, you need to know the geology, the plate tectonic, sedimentology, and we only talk about chemistry, also the biochemistry coming to this, uh, this part also, the, we knew, you need to study the chemical properties, tracers, and the other diesel coming, how these uh, chemicals uh, are formed and how they are transforming into the water, also we need to know. Also, we need to know the geography, the some uh, coastal land forming, the world climate, and the biology, uh, like the fisheries ecology, these are part of the biology. And when there's a tidal force, and if you know, if you need to know uh, the origin of water or any meteorites uh, found in the oceans, then we, we have to go, go for the astronomy. So this is a, uh, like a big um, arena, but of course ocean itself is study all the ocean, but when you talk about the ocean science, you need to come from this uh, region. But of course you will, uh, you have to decide which part you go, which part you will study more or in any of this biological, geographical, chemical, or meteorological. So then you will study or then explore more of these uh, topics. So this is a good opportunity, like uh, if you study your, uh, the ocean science, then you can know all some, all parts by little. So thanks for kind attention. So that's all from me. Is there any question you can ask? Well, thank you, sir. Uh, you can off this screen sharing. Well, uh, there's no problem. We can start the question answering session. I am asking uh, our co-host, Ishrat Ila to start this session, question answering session. Please, Ishrat Ila, uh, unmute yourself and uh, start the question answering session. Thanks to Mr. Jahin Khandokar. How could you expect insightful knowledge without asking questions? On the grounds of this, we have lots of questions from our participants who want to overcome the barrier of queries and I'm here to lay bare the questions. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the question assessment session. This is Isra Jahan Ila from Octofield. And you're today's host for this segment. 15, I'd like to thank Mr. Mahmoud Hassan for this bouncing and educational session. Now, to start with the first question from Suet Faisal Ahmed. His question is, sir, can you please differentiate among Panjia, Laurasia, and Gondwana land? Uh, from this, as I told you, this is a hypothesis. Uh, and from the pictures I have shown, no cannot uh, differentiate it. And uh, it's, uh, as, uh, as being an oceanographer, this, uh, this to get an idea, but this is not very really important for that time. But uh, as uh, I told you, this is, uh, to show that uh, hypothesis that is uh, proposed by that uh, um, uh, that Alfred Wagner. Uh, from that, my graph, so I could cannot differentiate that. Uh... Okay. Oh, okay, sir. Thank you. Uh, proceeding to the next question. The question is from Nibir. He wants to know, I did not understand the difference, difference among they, Gulf and Delta. Okay. Um, so I can show you the... Okay. So the bay is a, the water body that is on land and three side. The more important thing, remember, I can show you the... Can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Yes, sir. Yes, we can see. Okay. So bay is uh, surrounded by, by three sides on the land. Okay. 
But on the other hand, the Gulf <clears throat> is a narrow strait. Uh, if you remember the videos, they were, you can uh, see the, the difference of the bear. But still, I can show you here. You see the Gulf of Botnia, OK? This is a Gulf because it is a surrounded by three parts. But if you go to the Bay of Bengal, if you remember, you see this more open. It is not surrounded by the three parts completely. It has more open ocean water area. Okay, wait. So the idea is the bay should be always compared to some three areas, then and the Gulf is more usually narrow mouth, but almost surrounded by the land. And the strait is, is a just narrow passage, like in this uh, picture, you can see. If I, it is clear for him, or I can explain more if it is not clear to him. Is that okay? Okay, next. Well, uh, I think there is a problem with our co-host uh, internet connection. I am continuing uh, continuing the session. Uh, the, the next question is uh, from Shukumar Chandra Das to everyone. Well, uh, does salinity differ according to the depth and how it's differ? Uh, sorry, can you repeat? Does salinity differ according to the depth and how it's differ? Uh, as I told you, the salinity doesn't differ very much in the world ocean. And uh, uh, it, it is more or less constant in the, in the surface ocean, but uh, also it's more say in the same as in, in the depth of the ocean. So it doesn't really vary. But uh, uh, you can see the, um, from this, um, uh, sorry, here. And the coastal region, the upper surface is mostly less saline and the, uh, and the surface on the depth, I mean the, the deeper part of the ocean is uh, more saline. It, uh, as I told you, this uh, saline range, it doesn't vary in, in the depth uh, of the ocean. If, uh, this uh, this uh, measurement is calculated it from the based on the world the world ocean data I mean all over the ocean, but of course uh, if you when you calculate or when you measure some some uh, some specific area with uh, some CTD some oceanographic instruments you can find a difference in like very few percentages few. Uh, 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 the changes in the practical salinity unit. So no, no basically it doesn't change a lot, but uh, if you measure it uh, with the brackish water, like in the, if you go to brackish, like uh, in this part of the Mediterranean, if you're less saline, and if you go to the, um, in the Baltic Ocean, the, it is uh, uh, less saline water. So it, it is, doesn't depend, uh, it depends on the area, but it, uh, in the depth, it doesn't uh, vary a lot. Well, uh, thank you for this kind uh, of answer. And uh, I'm going to the next question. The next question is from Kanak NGR to every uh, Kanak NGR. He's asking that what is the minimum surface temperature and bottom temperature of a sea? No, there is no uh, uh, me. Minimum surface temperature, surface temperature, and yeah, uh, uh, sorry. Yes, you can see there's a range here, right? You can say from uh, minus two to 35, it can be. So, and depending on the ocean, and depending on the area, or depending on the season, this uh, temperature can vary. But the range is between this, minus two to 35, uh, 35 degrees centigrade. So, Minimum you can find in the Arctic, in the poles, 
like you can see here uh, in the blue region, in the southern region, and in the Arctic Ocean, in the Greenland Sea, uh, and the Arctic Circle, this part. And here you can see the temperature is very high in the around the <clears throat> around the equatorial region. So, so there here you can find like 25, 26, uh, and of course there are also it varies uh, in the winter in the northern hemisphere during the summer the temperature is high. When uh, but in the now in the south, uh, southern hemisphere like in Australia, South Africa, the summer. There is summer now. You can find um, high temperature in the uh, in the their part of the ocean. So there is no minimum or uh, maximum, uh, but the range is minus two thirty five degree. Of course, uh, um, if it is more than forty degrees and there is not is uh, 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 common that is not acceptable. I mean that is uh, not tolerable by the human. So if it is more than for forty or it is minimum. Uh, five degrees centigrade, uh, the scientist or researcher will know about the because it is the observation is a continuously going on all over the ocean. Well, uh, thank you. The next uh, next question is from Akanksha Ingail. She is asking that does the amount of light available to the organism influence the size of organisms? Uh, now, the, not really because light used by the only primary producer that uh, is phytoplankton or plankton, the plankton use this uh, light to produce the food, that to survive. And these phytoplankton are consumed by the zooplankton, the next level consumer. And the, the zooplankton are consumed by the small fishes, by large fishes. So if you think about this variable, light penetration or light. So it is, it is depend on the, uh, it is used by the only the plankton. So of course, um, uh, when the, in the summertime and during the springtime, when the light and the surface in the high is very high, the production the, is very high. And it, these are animals are very, very small in as the millimeter or few centimeter. So, in, in naked eyes, you can make a big differentiate like that. Of course, there are many, many studies of that, uh, but I'm not an expert on that uh, because there are many more deep studies on this if there is a, a influence or on the light availability on the animals. But the important thing, light is used by the only primary producer. Well, uh, the next question is from Juan Huang, Ria, Huang Rinan, Im, Emmanuel uh, Kalebi Miden Nuedia. Well, uh, she's asking that what could be the rule of upwelling in the pollutant trans, transport and circulation at the large marine ecosystem scale? Uh, can I go check the questions again? Uh, I think it's a so big What question. could be the rule of upwelling? in the pollutant transport? Oh, pollutant transport. Yes, yes, there is possible because uh, uh, because appalling is a process uh, that brings the nutrients from, from the lower part of the ocean or seas to the surface. So if there are pollutants that are dissolved, if it, the pollutants are dissolved or like the light particles or like elements uh, that uh, uh, that sinks in the ocean. Like nowadays, you can, the COVID situation, you can see if you can find it. And like there are some masks and other, any other plastic things. If it is uh, not very heavy, it is quite possible this kind of pollutants can be carried out by the pulling process to the surface. And also, appalling is not only involved, there are other oceanic currents involved in this floating and transporting these any pollutants. But remember, pollutants can be organic or inorganic, can be plastic, can be degradable, and can be heavier, less than many kinds. So in general, if it is, if the pollutants can float with the ocean current, or it is possible to bring them to the surface of the earth. 
ocean or on the near the coast well thank you uh, the next question is from nivir and uh, he is asking that conveyor belt what was that or oh, he is uh, asking about the conveyor belt actually Okay, the conveyor belt is the same thing is the global thermal and circulation, and you can see this is the largest surface current on the ocean. So when um, uh, this is a, like a the age of this uh, circulation process is like more than one thousand years. This process is continuous uh, in the in the ocean. So you can see this warm. This means when the warm water and more saline water flows from the <clears throat> uh, Atlantic, deep flowing to the Arctic Ocean. In when it reaches to the Arctic Ocean, and then it starts to sink because of it getting dense and colder. The dense we know the dense and cold water cannot float, so it starts to sink. That means then water flow, the dense and cold water flows below the surface of the Pacific Ocean, okay? And, the, and it goes again, and at some point, maybe this, until this point, maybe 200 years, this point, maybe 300, 500, we don't know about that, but this is a approximation uh, of this uh, circulation uh, time. And in like in the Indian Ocean or in the Pacific, sorry, in the Pacific Ocean, it comes to the surface when it get in the water getting more warmer and saline. So warm and saline water comes to the surface and it releases this heat uh, from the, <clears throat> it's getting from the atmosphere. So the total process, the total circulation is called thermal circulation or other name is called oceanic conveyor belt. It's called oceanic conveyor belt. So is, is there another name of global thermal circulation? Well, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mahmoud Hassan. And uh, the next question is from Shakil, and uh, he's asking that what is Coriolis effect? Nice, Coriolis effect. This is, uh, this is very interesting. I mean, maybe some people who did not study, it is find it's difficult uh, to understand, but uh, still I, I try to explain in simpler way. <clears throat> I tried to, I, 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 uh, I'm telling you, of course, so uh, as being an oceanographer, I don't study these things all very specific and deeper. The people who study current, they only study current. People who study the biology, or they study more about this. So they know more, more, more better than me. But I can explain in my, from my experience, from my knowledge in simpler way. So the correlation effect is, is the, uh, when the earth moves, we know the earth moves, right? 20, 20, uh, for the movement rate is 24 hours, okay? So the, if you, when you're standing in a, in, a, in, a, in a position, but in a naked eyes or open eyes, we don't feel that, we don't see that the differences. So when you start to run in a, in a certain location like straight, you feel the uh, disturbance of the air. So the air is passing both sides of you. So like a train, if train is moving, when train is passing, you feel the air. If you stand by any side of the, the train line, you feel a air pressure. So in the left side and both sides. This is the same technique works for the Coriolis effect. When the earth like moves around the sun, like in the equatorial region, the earth feels that uh, wind pressure, wind circulation uh, in both sides. Like in the, in the Northern hemisphere, in the other in the upper side and North side, it, uh, this pressure, it moves, this wind flow moves to the right of your side. Like if you uh, stay in the train line, you feel the left side. If you stay in the left side, you feel left side. If you stay in the right side of the train line, you feel the uh, wind pressure, wind, uh, in the right side. So same thing works here. So when you, in the southern hemisphere, the, <clears throat> the, this wind moves to the, or any object moves to the left side of, if you stay there. So 
that is the main principle uh, that we call it Coriolis effect. So of course, uh, you cannot see in, uh, you cannot feel them, but uh, in Earth is a big land mass, it move, is moving. And over the ocean surface, uh, the winds are blowing continuously, and then it creates the Coriolis effect. Well, uh, thanks to Mr. Hassan uh, for this informative and a lively session. Um, due to our time shortage, we can't uh, fulfill the question answering session. We can't answer every question you have asked, uh, but we have tried. Well, uh, we are finishing this session for today. Good night, good morning, good evening, good noon to everyone. And thanks to our honorable lecturer, Mr. Hassan. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, okay, I will uh, pass the presentation to you. Well, thanks to all.